I'm pleased to introduce Evan Parker. Uh, some of you might know him already if of being on past webinars. He is our technical specialist, and he's the one who answers all the emails that you send in and also now is opening himself up to answer all your questions here, which is great because there's lots of different questions. But um, Evan is a professional photographer, and he's a custom printer based in Seattle. He specializes in architecture and interiors for the past 16 years and works with fellow photographers to help them create the best possible prints. Though he began in the darkroom, he has come to prefer the possibilities and relative simplicity of inkjet printing. His goal is to demystify the printing process and to make it part of the creative process. I'm pleased to introduce Evan. Um, Evan, you are, I think already have a question up there from Elizabeth, I think that you might want to answer. got a few. I'm gonna run back to the beginning here. So Gene asks, can you explain DMAX? What value do you want to print black and white images? So uh, DMAX is the darkest black you can get on a paper. And it's different for every printer and every paper, and even the same paper on different printers can give you a different DMAX. So it's it's more of a, an academic number than a real, uh, real world number, but the one thing to keep in mind is a photo black paper, a semi-gloss luster, Beraita, that sort of thing will always give you the appearance of a darker black because it reflects more light, whereas a matte paper will give you the appearance of a slightly lighter black because it doesn't reflect quite as much light and it scatters that reflection a little bit more. So um, it, it comes down to aesthetics. Do you want uh, that sort of softer, more painterly look that you get with a matte paper? Do you want that more photorealistic exact look that you get with a photo black paper? Um, and the best thing, kind of what we always say is, especially if you're exploring new papers or you're kind of new to printing in general, pick up our sample box that's two sheets of all of our papers, download the profiles, and then take that black and white image that you want to print and run it on five or six different papers and then lay them all out and, and see how the differences in the paper affect your image and, and kind of what you really prefer for your work. So. Hope that helps. Um, just to interrupt real quick, I just wanted to mention on the right hand side is a red dot that says offers. We have a free ebook on fine art printing written by our Moab master Lester Picker. So download that. It's absolutely free. 163 pages fully illustrated that uh, brings you from downloading ICC profiles to color management to actually printing and framing. It's a great book. So uh, just click on that uh, button there and it brings you over to a link. Definitely, definitely worth downloading a lot, of, a lot of good information in there. And, and I'm sure some things we'll cover today in a little more detail. Um, I will try to just go through this in order. And uh, here's one from Richard about uh, displaying a print behind glass. What advice do you have on the paper to use? Uh, does that matter? So the glass can change the appearance a little bit. But the biggest key is when you have any framed piece of art, you want to light it properly. So the idea is to have the art on the wall and then uh, as best as you possible, a light at a 45 degree angle. And that way, when you're viewing that piece of art, you're not seeing a reflection of the light fixture or glare off the paper or anything else like that. If you have a situation that you're gonna hang a piece of art where you don't have control over the lighting or it has light from a lot of angles, a matte paper will reduce the amount of possible reflections in that print. But generally the glass, uh, especially if you're using a museum glass or, or we always recommend glass, a higher quality glass, the glass kind of disappears and you really look through it and see the paper underneath. So not an advantage, disadvantage, except if you have a lot of a lot of different angles and a lot of reflections on that paper might help. Andrew asked about getting older uh, uh, ICC profiles for older printers. He specifically mentioned the uh, Epson 1430. Um, 1430, yeah. So we have profiles for the 1430. Let's switch over there. So on our website, oh, our latest update, we are open and shipping products. So on our website, if you go to ICC profiles and then ICC profiles downloads and Epson Artisan 1430. So I think 1280 from many, many years ago. So pretty much any photo printer from the last 15, almost 20 years now we do have 
Um, here's Elizabeth, Elizabeth's question that I was going to uh, ask a while ago. She's printing a five by seven image on an eight and a half by 11 matte paper, and she keeps getting the error message. The selected paper size does not have wide margins, depending on the environment. If you continue printing with the current settings, conditions such as paper abrasion may cause paper strains, uh, deterioration yes. of print quality. What does that mean? So that means that Elizabeth has a Canon Pro 1000. And that is a little note from Canon saying that if you're printing on a matte paper, it is possible, if that paper has a little curl to it, that you could get a head strike on your print. Um, and they, they give you that warning. So the way around it is in print settings. And, and it's, it's, I've never had issues with it, so you can, you can safely kind of ignore it and use this technique to move on. So we're in the, the print window. We'll select the Canon Pro 1000. And I'm guessing we're probably using a matte paper. So we're going to go ahead and choose matte photo paper. And then if you go to paper detailed settings right here, um, you see this little checkbox that says cancel margin regulation. That, when you check it, lets you print up to the edge or borderless, borderless on a matte or um, fine art paper, and then you'll no longer get that little notice about having the wrong margins or anything else like that. So just paper detailed settings and check the box for cancel margin regulation. And then it gives you that, that warning, you say okay, and away you go. Uh, Frank is asking, what's the meaning of native resolution for a printer? Epson is 360 PPI and Canon is 300 PPI. Should you pay attention to it? So I've, I've had answers both ways. Uh, native resolution was really important back when computers were slow and it took a lot of processing power to either up res or generally down res an image. Uh, I've spoken with a couple of photographers who do a lot of printing and they they still do recommend 360 for Epson and 300 for Canon. I think at smaller print sizes, probably up to 13 by 19, I'm gonna guess that the difference is negligible. I haven't, I haven't made specific side-by-side -side prints. I believe it really starts to matter when you're getting up into a 24 by 36 or something even larger. Um, and in that case, you're probably having to add some resolution. So then you would wanna do a, a slow interpolation in Photoshop where you're adding pixels instead of feeding a low resolution image to the printer and letting the print driver do some significant image resizing uh, to enlarge the print. So I think in Lightroom, you can specify a specific output resolution. So just keep an eye on the dimensions of your file and, and what, your, what size you're printing. And then you can see if you need to do some manual up resing or if, or if you're all set with the original dimensions. Uh, Tom asks in his Epson driver, what paper setting do you use for four by five inch Somerset velvet since that size is not offered for fine art papers? Got it. So any of, yes, any of our uh, recommended media settings that are fine art for Epson, the smallest you'll be able to use is, uh, is uh, sorry, eight by 10. So on our site for most Epson Printers. Let's just look at the, say the P800 here. We actually have two different profiles, one that uses the fine art media setting, and then one that uses ultra premium matte as the media setting. So if you're trying to print smaller than 8x10 using one of our papers, obviously he said Somerset Velvet, which does not have that option. Oh, sorry, I forgot that. So what you can do is just go ahead and you'll have to use ultra premium presentation mat or um, enhanced mat or archival mat. Epson calls those different things depending on what your region is. But yeah, go ahead and test it with ultra premium mat. The, the colors should be very similar and that'll allow you to print on those sheets that are smaller than eight by 10. Jay asks a question that we get asked quite a lot, especially at trade shows. Um, printer suggestions specifically do we have any suggestions on printers for the best archival quality 
So both Canon and Epson, um, their majority of their photo lineup is pigment ink, and pigment ink is key to archival prints. In each printer manufacturer, the least expensive photo printers. So for Canon, it's the Pro 100. For Epson, it's, uh, it was the Artisan 1430, now it's the XP 15,000. Those use dye ink, which is not considered to be anywhere near as archival as pigment. So any any printer up from the from the least expensive model is is one that you want. And then it mainly depends how you choose your printer on what features you want. So if you want to print on roll paper and you want um, a desktop printer, you'll have to use, at this point, you have to use an Epson. Canon doesn't offer roll paper capability until you get up into their much larger 24-inch like the printer that's sitting behind me. And then in terms of, of print quality and, and gamut and all that sort of thing, Canon and Epson are pretty close to being tied. We obviously have some new Epsons that were announced this month. I'm not sure when they're going to ship, but those might be worth a look when they come out. It's going to be the first Epson desktop printer that doesn't require you to switch between matte black and photo black ink. So you can print a glossy sheet and immediately print a matte sheet and not have to waste ink in the, in the switch. So looking forward to seeing what those can do. But in terms of longevity, the one the one main requirement is that you definitely want to keep an ink printer. Uh, just a reminder, if anybody's screen freezes up, just to hit your refresh, browser refresh, that will do the trick. Um, we've had some complaints about that, and it's the server on, on the uh, webinars side that unfortunately uh, causes that to happen. James asks about metallic papers. Uh, he's using metallic pearl, slick rock metallic pearl for his black and white. He keeps trying to up the brightness, but gets mixed results. Any tips for using metallic papers? So he's using the pearl, our slick rock metallic pearl, which is a white based, uh, white metallic. Um, so in terms of, of increasing the brightness, I guess that if, you, if you're increasing the exposure on your file, then you're gonna quickly start losing highlight detail. Um, if your prints appear to be coming out dark compared to your monitor, then the question is, have you recently calibrated your monitor and when you were calibrating it, did you set the brightness appropriately for print? I notice Al also says here, how important is it to pick the proper monitor brightness when you're calibrating? So a quick note on that is a lot of the monitor calibrators will let you enter a brightness value. The, the technical number is, what is it, candela per meter squared. So it's CD slash M2 is what you'll see. But somewhere between 120 and 160 on that scale, I believe 160 is the, is the standard. But that will ensure that your monitor is as closely matched to uh, print brightness. Obviously, your monitor will always appear just a little brighter um, because your monitor is emitting light whereas a print is reflected light. So make sure your monitor brightness is set correctly. And then the last piece is to have a consistent light source to evaluate your prints. So uh, I remember I was talking to a family member who got uh, school pictures back for her daughter this past week and, and she was standing in her house and she said, oh, these are really green. And I said, well, step outside. And she walked outside and, and was shocked to see that suddenly in sunlight, which is full spectrum, they were beautiful looking prints instead of the green prints that were appearing inside our house. So we recommend uh, at the high end, you can get a, a 5,000 degree Kelvin full spectrum LED bulb. So that gives you a very neutral, not too yellow full spectrum light for evaluating your prints. But if you just want to use even a standard halogen bulb, again, that's full spectrum. It's going to be a little more yellow, a little warmer, but that will give you a, a proper brightness and a, and a proper appearance to your print. So generally, unless you have a file that's very underexposed, you don't necessarily want to adjust the brightness of your file. You want to look at all the other parts that go into the print process that can influence how the print appears and then how we see it once it comes out. Just to go back to calibration, um, what calibrator would you recommend? So right now, um, one of the ones that, that we have seen great results with, and I'll switch here, is the x right the i1 Display Studio. Um, I believe this used to be the Color Monkey Display, and then the i1 Display Pro uses the same hardware, as far as I remember. 
but these are, oh, they have them on sale now, they're about 150 bucks. Uh, they, they work with uh, Adobe RGB displays, so if you have a 10-bit monitor, you can calibrate that with this. They also let you specify the brightness parameters, all that sort of thing, and X-Rite has a lot of great support videos and information on their website, so if you're learning about color and brightness and printing and kind of how to put it all together, they're a great resource. And also, if you have any questions, their support is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, so you get to call and talk with someone who knows the products hands-on and can really guide you when you have questions. So the Island Display Studio is definitely our recommendation for a great monitor calibrator. And it's one of those things where you might look at it and say, ah, I don't know if I want to spend 150 bucks, but you know, you've, you've bought the printer, you've invested in the paper and the camera and the lenses, and calibrating your screen is a, is a critical part of, of getting good, number one, good file prep, and also getting good prints and it can save you a lot of time and headache and, and wasted ink and everything else like that. So if you are if you are printing a lot or even a little and you don't have a monitor calibrator, definitely put that at the top of your list because it's really going to help with your output. And they they last quite a long time. A, you know, a professional um, studio that might rely on it for output is going to go ahead and get it recertified every couple of years. These smaller ones, you don't have to do that. But well, you, know, you can do that. But they're they're reliable for I would say five, seven, eight years. I've seen them, and then at that point the technology's leapfrog. So far, you, you want to kind of update it to whatever the new standards are. Great. Uh, Jim is editing in his image in Adobe Camera Raw, and then opening up in Photoshop his version of CS6. Uh, his saturation yeah. is about twenty percent less. His monitor is calibrated, and he can see the correct monitor profiles being used. <laughs> Why does this image saturation change going from the Adobe Camera Raw over to Photoshop? That's a great question. And you might want to look in your, in your Photoshop color settings. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Obviously, CS6 um, is a much older piece of software. Obviously, it's the last one that Adobe offered without a subscription. So I know a lot of folks out there use it because you don't have to pay for it every month. But you might, since that, product is definitely out of support, you might post that question in the Adobe form and see if another user out there has an idea. But I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head why that would be the case. OK. Uh, Lisa is asking also a question on smaller size paper with her Epson P800. Um, she's been trying to print with a custom paper size. She created this under the paper size and made a custom size. She cut the Moab Legion mat. Uh, LaSalle photo mat using all the correct profile and paper type settings. and But she keeps getting the error message, the paper source selected in the printer driver does not match the paper loaded in the printer. I bet that's because when you make a custom paper size, the shorter edge has to be the first number. So let's go take a look at that right now. Let's see. Okay, so um, print, and we'll say the Epson P800. So for those of you who haven't done a custom paper size, you're going to go into print settings, this is at least on the Mac, and then right here, paper size, you scroll all the way to the bottom, and it says manage custom sizes. Now you can see we use this a lot, so all of these papers here are custom sheet sizes that I've made. But when we go in here, so we can see, um, let's see. So for instance, our artist cards, those are uh, seven by 10 sheet. So you wanna make sure that the seven inch, the shorter dimension is always in as the width and then the longer dimension in as the height. And then when you feed that sheet into the printer, you always wanna feed it in shorter edge first. So just like when you're loading a letter sheet, the eight and a half, the eight and a half edge goes in first and the 11 is the vertical dimension. When you're feeding in the cards or any other custom media size, you want to feed it short edge in and then and then the long edge is sitting vertically. So I assume perhaps uh, you have the numbers swapped and you have the longer dimension on width and then the printer will definitely not want to load that paper because it's, it's expecting something else. And if you're using roll printers, the width of the roll is always that that first dimension, so either 17, 24, 36, 44, that sort of thing. So hopefully that helps. 
Walter asks about the shelf life on paper, and um, if you can comment on that, because he doesn't print that much, but he has it sitting around. Is there a shelf life on the paper? And if you can offer some storage uh, suggestions as well. Yeah, so the best thing you can do on on our paper is to store it in the box in which you bought it. So in, in the box is, a, is an archival plastic bag that then the, the paper sits in there. Store it flat on the shelf, try not to store it on edge. If you store it on edge, then the sheets can kind of slide down and, and curl on one edge. So store it flat, store it in a, in a part of your house that has the least temperature swings. I, I suppose you could, you could treat it like you treat your, your wine collection, you know, in a, in a temperature stable, not too humid room and, and stored in the original packaging paper should be good for, for a number of years. Obviously I would, Kind of like canned goods buy what you think you're going to use so buy a 25 sheet pack instead of a 100 sheet pack if you're not going to print all that much obviously if you are printing just a little or you have a lot of papers and you use one here one there we've we've seen no issues with paper sitting on the shelf for a number of years i wouldn't i wouldn't hesitate i think some folks have called in with with paper they've had for almost a decade and and they just want to know hey do you still have a profile for this or whatever else but but the paper that they've been storing for so long is, is still all set to go. Definitely because these are all archival buffered acid free sheets, they're they're designed to last the long term. So you shouldn't see any degradation of the paper over over storage. Eileen is asking uh, about the platen gap or the platen gap. Some people refer to it as both. Um, when do you need to adjust that? Yeah, so you want to adjust that. We have some notes on our website that actually I do believe I need to update because I just learned a few things. So let me navigate there real quick. So on our site, uh, it's under support, and we have Epson printer notes here. So I know somebody asked about printing fine art media with with smaller sheets. That's a that's a something we talk about right here. And I guess I haven't added a note about paper thickness yet. I'll have to find that. But what you want to do is for any, any media, let's see, for us, mainly the juniper is when you want to do it with. So the juniper is a much thicker paper than the premium luster media setting that it uses. So if you're on an Epson printer and you're printing the juniper, I recommend that instead of leaving the platen gap at standard, you take one step up and you set it to, I believe it's wide. And that helps prevent any head strikes because the printer is expecting a thin, like a 0.3 millimeter thick sheet in a luster and you're giving it a 0.5 or 0.6 millimeter thick sheet in the Juniper. So great question and something that, that we need to add on the site or at least I need to, if I added it, uh, make it readily available. The other ones are if you're using Entrada 300 with the ultra premium matte media setting, we offer again two profiles for Entrada, one using the fine art media setting, which is set for a thicker paper, and one using the premium matte media setting, which lets you use the sheet feeder or print on smaller sheets. So if you're using ultra, if you're using one of our 300 gram fine art papers with the ultra premium matte media setting, then you'd want to do the same thing. You'd want to go into advanced media control and set the platen down to why. So I'm sure a follow-up from some of our viewers would be, well, that's great, but how do I do it? So let's look at that real quick. So here we are with the Epson P800. And then go into print settings. We're going to say that we're using the Juniper, so it'll be on a letter sheet. Printer settings, sheet feeder. I know the media setting for that is ultra premium photo paper luster, so we choose that. And then we go to advanced media control. You can see right here it says platen gap with a standard and wide. So if you're using the Juniper, go ahead and set the platen gap to wide and then hit save and that will give the printer a little more space when feeding the paper and should prevent you from getting any uh, head strikes on the edge of the sheet or the leading or trailing edge or anything else like that. Good, good question. I have a question from Scott about the difference between using our generic profiles uh, versus custom or making one's own profiles. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, so with our profiles, especially for newer printers, I'd say the Epson P series, the Canon Image ProGraph, the Pro 1000, Pro 2000, um, 
we've got some really great profiling hardware that we use from X-Rite, and, and we're doing a lot of, of testing and verification on those profiles. So I know that they're they're very good. There are, so so number one, we work as hard as we can to give you the best profiles that, that we can create. And stepping away from that, if you, if you want to become a color nerd and you want to spend a, a lot of time, you can create your own profiles, but I don't necessarily recommend it because to do it well, you need to make a significant investment in, in colorimeter or spectrophotometer hardware. And then you also need to spend a lot of time working with media settings and, and understanding all that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a long learning process. I've been at it for many years and, and Every month I learned something new that, that goes into our profiles. So if you want to make a hobby out of it, then then by all means jump in. But but for most of us, um, you know, try our try our OEM profiles, our, our profiles that we make. And if something seems not quite right or whatever else, there are a number of companies out there that do offer custom profiles for a pretty reasonable price. And they'll walk you through the process of maybe if you need to choose a different media setting and printing the targets and that sort of thing. But if you're looking to get maybe that last couple of percent in color accuracy or, or whatever else, or you're doing addition printing on a specific paper where it really needs to be to be critical, then then sometimes having someone make that custom profile for you really takes it the, the extra step. But again, I think the I think the assumption is that printers can vary by up to five percent, but usually it's less than that. So for for most all the work out there, the profiles that we create are are, are very accurate and, and will give you a very good print. A question, we have a couple questions here and you might've touched on this earlier, Evan. So apologies if you're repeating yourself, but um, what's the ideal screen brightness setting for printing when calibrating with i1 Studio? Yeah, so the ideal screen brightness and, and it's in the X-Rite calibration software as you're working through it. It's between 120 and 160 and the the measurement is candela per meter squared, which is just a fancy measure of brightness, but you'll see it, it's a CD slash M2. So candela is per meter squared. And the industry standard is 160. Sometimes I find that that seems a little brighter on the monitor here than when I'm making a print. So I sometimes vary between 120 and 160, but either of those should get you really close. And if you find that when you're not editing and printing, that that's maybe a little dim for your environment. There's no reason why you can't increase your monitor brightness for email or web or, or whatever else. Just leave yourself a little note that says, hey, when you're editing photographs, don't forget to, to turn it back down. But yeah, 120 to 160 is the, is the number that you're looking for. Um, Bob is printing on Canvas with his Epson P7000, and he's wondering if using the built-in cutter will dull it over time, or if he should just cut it on a rotor trim afterwards? Uh, well, canvas is obviously cloth versus paper, but I, yes, you will dull it over time. However, any paper will, will dull your cutter over time. So for me, it's a matter of when I'm making a, a bigger print on canvas, it's, a, it's an exercise in not bending it or crimping it or whatever else to get it from the printer over to the rotor trim. So I, I kind of override it and I just have the printer trim it and figure if in three years, instead of three and a half years, I have to replace the cutter blade. That's a, a small price to pay for, for having the printer cut it nicely and then I can remove it safely. So uh, your mileage may vary. And, and of course, you know, they don't generally recommend it. So I'm, I'm saying, yes, you can do it, but uh, not an endorsement <laughs> if for some reason your, your cutter jams and whatever else. But uh, we, we do it a lot around here. And, and have not suffered ill effects. Um, as we're about the, at the halfway point, I just wanted to mention for those who didn't hear it earlier, we are giving away a free ebook on printing written by Lester Picker. It's available in the offers tab uh, right near in that chat window. So you can click on that, click on the link and it brings you to a page where all you have to do is enter your email address and you get a free download link. It's filled with a lot of information that Evan's talking about today, plus a lot more from calibration through printing, through through framing, and even protecting your prints. And there is a question here from uh, Stephen about what's the advantage of using a spray coating uh, like desert varnish, varnish on your pigment prints? What's the pros and cons? Would you recommend, would you coat a paper that was going to be framed? 
So if you're gonna frame with a UV filtering glass, there's really no advantage to coating the paper. Um, if you're gonna frame with a sort of inexpensive, out of the box, regular plate glass you might get in a, in a drugstore frame, uh, that, that can make a difference. But the desert varnish is really intended, intended only for matte papers because of the way they absorb the coating and when you apply it, it actually disappears into the surface of the paper and you can't tell after 10 or 20 minutes that you've coated that print. And the main reason why we make it is for portfolios, or books, or other prints that are likely gonna be handled, number one. It helps prevent smudgy fingerprints and, and scratches and scuffing and that sort of thing. And then the secondary part to that is if you have a matte print that maybe you don't wanna frame, you want, you're using one of the Japanese papers and you want that surface to just be available for the viewer to look at, then we absolutely recommend that you coat it because that, that spray is what's going to give it the UV resistance and a little humidity protection and that sort of thing. And if you're, I think our, our default recommendation is two coats of the desert varnish. If you are going to just leave that print, you know, in an open front frame or something else like that, no harm in, in adding even a third coat of the varnish just to make sure that, that you've got it well protected. And when you coat it, you're going to coat it one way, wait five minutes, rotate the print 90 degrees, coat it the same direction. If you do a third one, rotate the print again, and then do a third coat. So you're cross hatching your sprays on your different layers. And that helps to make sure that you get a nice, even consistent coverage. And if you want to see even more of Evan, there's a video showing, uh, yes. Evan actually shot it a while ago about how to spray and protect your prints. That's available on moabpaper.com and it's also on our YouTube channel as well. Um, you showed a test image earlier. Is that available for download uh, publicly or is that something that you created? It is, no, these are, you can find a lot of these online. Um, this is one of the ones that, that we use. The biggest thing is if you're looking to download this, if you put printer test image into say Google images, you'll see them all over the place in various flavors of RGB and TIFF and, and color spaces. If you if you want a full gamut, really reliable test image, this one is a 16-bit TIFF, and that gives you the most color data. So if you are looking to download it, I don't remember quite where this one came from, but you've used it for many years. But when you're when you're looking, if you can look in your image parameters and say, I want a 16-bit TIFF file. Then, then it'll narrow down to the, the sites that have it available at full resolution. If you're getting, say, an sRGB 8-bit JPEG, it has a significantly smaller gamut than, than Adobe RGB and then a 16-bit. So you're not going to be able to get as much out of it because it's clipping a lot of the colors before you even get a chance to print it. So yeah, make sure you're looking for a 16-bit TIFF in any test files that you're using for printing. David is asking about uh, RIP software such as Image Print. What are your thoughts on that or other RIP software? Yeah, so RIPs were originally developed for print shops, so you can take a lot of different size images and it automatically arranges them on a sheet of paper, generally for a roll printer, and then you can also set your own ink limits and, and build profiles and that sort of thing. So for, for photographers, especially printing at home, there's, there's two rips that, I've, that I hear a lot about. I haven't really used either one. Um, image print is number one, and image print is known for really great fine detail, good black and white. Uh, they do build, if you're, a, if you're an image print customer, they have two rips now. I believe the black is sort of their legacy product, and in that one, they build all their own profiles and, and all that sort of thing. Image print red gives you I think it's the same quality benefit, but you're using uh, manufacturer's profiles instead of image print custom profiles, so there's a big price difference between the two. And then on the other end, there's a, a rip out there for Epson printers called Quad Tone, which is solely for printing black and white. And that one has a bit of a learning curve. It's, it's not a, a real sort of GUI software. It's more of just a bunch of settings. But I've heard a lot of customers that, that print a lot in black and white have enjoyed image print. And, and again, if you really going down that, that quality road image, or sorry, quad tone does allow you to make your own black and white profile specifically. So if you're a black and white photographer, that might be 
one to explore. Moab has a number of uh, double-sided papers, Entrada being our most popular and probably the famous uh, paper in our range. Um, Stephen's asking about any tips on printing on both sides. Yeah, print the first side and then wait at least a half an hour if you can before you print the second side. That ink, once it's laid down, the pigment bonds into the surface of the paper, but the fluids out of the ink have to evaporate. And most of the fluids evaporate in the first 30 minutes or so. And as they evaporate, the, the pigment really sets. So your prints are most delicate when they're right out of the printer. So if you can, give it some time, half an hour, even an hour, before you go ahead and print that second side, and you should have a much lower risk of uh, scuffing or scratching the first side that you print. Also, if you have, if you're doing, say, a, a book or a portfolio, and you have a very dark, dark image on one side and a much lighter image, print the denser image second. Because the more ink you lay down on a matte paper, the more susceptible it can be to, to damaging that print. So as much as you can, print the less dense, lighter side first, and then the more dense, darker side second. And if you're looking for book pages, we do, again, along with the, uh, the Desert Varnish video, we do have a video about printing book pages. Because when you flip that sheet over, you then have to change a setting in Photoshop. So it, it rotates the second image, but it doesn't flip it because if you say flip horizontally then you've effectively mirrored your file whereas i forget what the setting is but it, it allows you to to print that second image oriented the correct direction but not uh not backwards to the view and that would be good for when you're building your own portfolios such as using our flint portfolios or you're just printing double-sided in a book and format and in some of the products that we offer and I noticed Bill is asking, he says, I love your Flint portfolio. They want me to print on any paper that I want to use in the 13 by 19 size, but I'm a portrait guy and wonder if you could ex be expected uh, to release a, this is a left spine and a 16 by 16. So likely we will not have a lot of different custom portfolios, but there's a great company out of San Francisco called Pina Zingaro, and they make pretty much any portfolio, size, material, uh, hinge left, hinge right, metal, wood, plastic, custom engraving, all that sort of thing. So if you're looking for something beyond our basic 8 and a half, 11 or 13 by 19 sizes, uh, Pina Zingaro is definitely where I would start for those, those real custom portfolio books, boxes, all that sort of thing. And, and they use the same hinge strip system that we have, so you can still use whatever paper you want and, and then just cut it to size, depending on the size of the book that you choose from them. So that's a great resource for custom portfolios. And Pina Zingara also uses the Moab uh, LaSalle photo matte papers in their books that they sell. Um, yes. So there's a nice continuity there. Um, can you talk a little bit about your environment, your setup? So there's a couple questions about um, editing and working on images. Do you have your lights turned off? in your room? Are you using, working under special lighting at your desk? Uh, what would interfere with your monitors? What, what, what's your workflow set up like? Yeah, so the best thing that you can do is to work in a number one, work in a room with relatively neutral colored walls as you can see here in, in my office. It's, it's mainly an off-white. If you're working in a room with, with a primary colored wall or a pink wall or, or whatever else, the, the environment around you is going to shape the way that you see neutral white. So if you're working in a, in a yellow room, your perception of what white is is gonna shift from, from neutral white to maybe a, a bluish white because your eyes are trying to compensate. So number one, as best as you can, work in a room with, with neutrally colored walls. Try not to work with a big light source behind you. So if I had a big window behind me, it would reflect off my monitor and it would be bringing all this bright light into the room so the room that I work in, there's a window, a north facing window on the other side of my desk, but that never gets direct light. And then behind me is, is what you see here. It's just a, a dark, well, relatively dark, no natural light lit room. If you're working in a room with, with big windows, you know, maybe have a, a translucent blind or something you can lower to reduce the amount of ambient light in the room. The other big thing is a lot of uh, laptops now come with an option that they have ambient light sensing. So as the room gets brighter, it'll brighten the monitor, and as the room gets darker, it'll darken the monitor. Well, for photography, that's an absolutely terrible thing because then you have really no idea what 
what your actual brightness is. So make sure when you're when you get a new computer, if you're going to use it for photo editing, turn that ambient adjustment off because that will that will cause you all sorts of issues. Um, if you're working and printing in the same room, going back to those light bulbs, if you can, you know, get a get a light bulb that is you know, around 5,000 degrees Kelvin, if if you don't mind a little cooler light, if if that's a little blue for you, you can get like a 3,000 to 4,000 degree Kelvin bulb and install those in your office. And then you'll have a real consistent color temperature for evaluating your prints. And also then when you're looking at your screen, the ambient light is the same color temperature that you're gonna use when you're looking at your prints. So it's all, it's all kind of arranged. Some people work in a really dark room, I find that if I turn off the lights and then do a bunch of color correcting, my files end up a little darker than I would like them. So if I view them in a different room or I'm looking at, a, at an online gallery on an iPad in my living room, oh, I've, I've adjusted all my photos a little darker because the ambient light was so dark. So I like to work with the lights on, but it's not super bright in here. I think these are uh, 60 or 80 watt equivalent lights. There's six of them in the ceiling in here. So, not too bright, not too dim, but the main thing is is consistent light quality, neutral colored walls, avoid a, a big directional window from the sun. And, and a lot of uh, monitors also come with a monitor hood. A lot of photography monitors, if they don't come with a monitor hood, you can build your own out of maybe six inches of, of uh, like black foam core and just mount it on three sides of your screen so it, it screens out so if you have a light above, it screens out the, the direct glare off your screen from a, from a light above. But, you know, we, we all make the best of our, of our situations. Those are ideal guidelines. But, you know, wherever you work, keep that in mind. In mind, if there are things that you can't change or maybe move your desk or whatever else to, to compensate. Mark is asking about uh, deciding what uh, matching a print to the paper. So when he's deciding to print, he often tries to match the print to a paper by looking at the color gamut warnings. How do you deal with those warnings to match the color gamut of the image to a paper if you have your heart set on a paper where you're getting color gamut warnings on the paper? All right, so uh, the question is regarding gamut. For those of you who are not quite familiar, gamut is the total number of colors that we can print on a paper. And because of paper finish, that black photo black, inks in your printer, that gamut is gonna vary between, uh, between different papers on a printer and between different printers on the same paper. So number one, don't fear an out of gamut warning. We use something called rendering intent to, to move the colors we can't print, which are out of gamut into the principal space, which are colors we can print or in gamut. Um, the software does a really good job of adapting colors. If you have a lot of out of gamut, and I'm gonna switch over to Photoshop to, to give you a little visual representation of what we're talking about here. Let's see, so first off, how do I know what's in gamut and what's out of gamut? So in Photoshop, you're gonna to go to view, proof setup, custom. And then once you're there, um, we'll pick, say, well, well, here's Moab Juniper Brita on the Epson P7000. Black point compensation we want to turn on. And then if I, I can do the preview on and off, and you can see right away that some of those color squares in the center change a little bit. So we're going to turn the preview on. And then we're going to go back up here and we're going to go view gamut warning. So gamut warning. It's going to show us in pink all the colors that we can't print exactly on this paper printer combination. Now, when I print this off on Juniper on the P7000, all this stuff highlighted in pink, it, it doesn't look bad. It just might not look exactly the same as what's on your monitor. So if you have an image that's almost 100% out of gamut, you know, then, then you might want to pick a paper that has a larger gamut. But in terms of this, Number one, don't fear out of gamut colors. And then also, as you're looking at this, I'm just going to turn off gamut warning and go back to proof setup. There's something called rendering intent. And rendering intent right here determines how those out of gamut colors are adapted when we print. And in Photoshop, you have four options. You're going to ignore saturation and you're going to ignore absolute color metric. 
those aren't necessarily meant for printing photographs. So our two we're focused on are relative color metric and perceptual. So relative color metric takes those out of gamut colors and moves them just to the edge of the printable space and doesn't change colors that are in the printable space. So it's the most predictable rendering intent for printing photographs. Perceptual takes all the colors and moves them a little bit to keep the, the um, relationships the same. So perceptual, if you have a lot of out of gamut colors, will prevent them from getting stacked up at the end of the printable space. It's gonna move everything. But if you compare it directly to your monitor, you'll see that maybe a few more colors have changed a bit in order to keep the, the relationships the same. So I think the best thing you can do is, kind of like we talked about in the beginning, if you have one of our sample boxes, take maybe two photographs that are really representative of your work, whether they're black and white or color or sunsets or portraits, um, print those on six or eight different papers and see how the gamut affects how the image looks and, and the base color of the paper and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's definitely no substitute for doing your own testing and really seeing what works and, and what really complements your work. Ron has a question about upgrading printers. How much better are the newer <laughs> Epson printers? compared to an older Epson 4800, which he has. Is it worth upgrading? What's the difference? Is the difference noticeable? So the Epson 4800, um, 4800 E-Series. So that's three ink generations different. Um, my assumptions would be uh, twofold. Number one, the new printers will have a larger color gamut. They'll also have a much darker black the best thing you can do is go down to your local camera store, hopefully you have one in the next couple of months, it will be open, um, and, and have a file that you've printed out on your printer at home and print the same file on one of their demo printers on the same paper and then do a, do a visual comparison. Because often they, you know, this printer has a 6% bigger gamut or, or whatever else, but what does that mean in, in the real world? You know, great, I bought a car that I can drive 160 miles an hour. I'll, I'll never get anywhere close to that. But boy, that's a great, that's a great stat. So if you're looking at, you know, maybe, maybe I have a printer that's a little older and, and I'm wondering whether I should upgrade, definitely the best thing you can do is to get a, get a print off that new printer on the same paper and see, see how it looks. That's going to be, but, but mainly um, darkest black and overall gamut are going to be the two things that you'll gain with a with a newer printer as long as you're staying you know with a pigment ink and that sort of thing going going from say dye ink to pigment ink is going to make a huge difference deborah has a question about a hanging system i think you have a few different suggestions on that she wants to know about a wall hanging system to display prints with several images in each column and the ability to rearrange easily yeah so what i actually have here in the office off screen is ikea sells a stainless steel wire with anchors at, at two ends. I think they intend it for curtains or other things like that. But it's a 24 foot wire. You can cut it to any length you want. You just mount it into, into a stud in your wall at both ends. Um, comes with a bunch of clips. That's been really great because I can put up or take down anything. You know, a lot of the stuff that we, that we shoot and print, we may not want to frame it and look at it for 40 years, but we certainly want to put it up and, and look at it for a year or two years or, or swap it out. And, and so that's a, that's a great, very inexpensive solution. I know we see a lot on online of people that string up uh, like string and, and uh, clothespins. Obviously that's one you can do out of the supplies in your laundry room. And then it goes up from there. There are trade show displays that use wires and, and big uh, clamps that are as wide as the print. So you can snap that onto the top of the print and kind of weights it and keeps it straight. But my favorite's just been a, an inexpensive wire with a bunch of clips on it. And then, and then kind of switching out artwork as, as the mood suits you, as you do something new, as you try a new paper, all that sort of thing. And obviously, though, when you're hanging prints like that, if you are working in a room with a whole lot of sunlight or other UV exposure, you know, because they're not protected and they're just out there in the environment, those prints may age over the years. Granted, you probably won't see much aging, but it is possible that, that you would see some environmental influence because they're, they are being displayed unprotected. 
Bob is printing uh, on roll papers, and afterwards he's running it through a D-roller. Should he wait before doing that? Or how I long? Would, I would absolutely wait. Um, <clears throat> kind of like printing the backside of the paper. If you're in a hurry, um, half an hour to an hour should be plenty. If you're working with a matte paper, maybe like a concert image where there's a whole lot of black or dark blue or whatever else, if you can let that sit overnight, I often have our roll prints come off the printer and in the basket they've rolled themselves up. So maybe it's an eight inch diameter, take it out of the printer, set it on end in its natural rolled form, let it dry overnight and then take that and put it in the, in the D roller. And that's going to give you the, the best chance for that print to really set into the paper surface and be as, as uh, bulletproof as possible before you go put it in the, in the D roller. I think the question has been answered. A few people are asking about uh, spelling Pina Zangaro. It, uh, uh, Stephen actually put the website up there, as did Alan. So it's P-I-N-A-Z-A-N-G-A-R-O.com, based out of San Francisco. Um, a question that often comes up is Barita, or some people say Brita. What does that mean? What is that? Barita is a, it, it is the sort of the trade name for a barium sulfate coating. It's been around uh, for many decades. It was the choice of air dried fiber papers back in the darkroom days. And the big difference is those darkroom papers had barita coating and then a silver halide layer, whereas modern barita papers have the barita layer and then an inkjet microporous coating. And what barita does is it gives the paper that slightly semi gloss shine and it also gives it. A, a brighter white and a better reflectivity than the base sheet so we don't have to use optical brighteners in those papers to have them appear a little bit whiter and by not using optical brighteners you're you're getting into the best um, best archival longest term stability of that that base color that you can get so it's a it's an old uh, compound repurposed for a new technology if you if you look up uh, barita or barium sulfate online, you can get a whole explanation of, of what it's made of and how they apply it and, and all that sort of thing. But it's, yeah, old old technology, new application. Otis has a fairly technical question regarding Photoshop Creative Cloud 2020 gamut warnings, which are somewhat aggressive compared to Lightroom. Why the slight difference for the same ICC profile? I don't have a direct answer for that. I know that Photoshop 2020 is, it's seeming a lot better now when it was when it was rolled out. We definitely got a lot of customer questions about uh, prints that were off and color management that wasn't working, especially on the Mac. I think Adobe and, and Apple had some software miscommunication there and caused a lot of people a lot of heartache. Um, if you are, my, my personal recommendation, especially in the, in these days of yearly operating system updates and, and aggressive subscription software updates is number one, upgrade conservatively and, and also keep your old version as a backup. So for instance, on, on the machine that I use for testing, I have many different versions of Photoshop so that as a new one comes out, if I have any trouble with it or anything, I can go back to the previous version that I know is, is stable. And same goes for operating system updates. Uh, a lot of people that upgraded to the new uh, Mac operating system that came out in the fall had a lot of software incompatibilities and some printing issues and, and that sort of thing and, and ended up in a real tight spot because once you upgrade your operating system, it's hard to roll it back. So before you do any major software upgrades, if it's a specific application, you know, keep the previous version. If it's an operating system, really do your homework and, and maybe ask fellow photographers or friends or whoever else have you done it? What's been your experience? Um, if you have two computers, upgrade maybe the, the less critical one and, and work with it and make sure that it's a, a solid build before you go and upgrade your whole system because uh, it's it's the new, we sort of take it for granted that the software is good and when it's not, it's, it's hard to address that if you don't have a, a fallback plan. So we have sorry time, the, go ahead, sorry. I say sorry for the not specific answer, but but definitely as you're working through this, you know, be aware of what you're updating. We have time for one more question, maybe two. Um, a question about um, uh, using a color profile when printing in black and white. Yeah, so two, 
uh, two things you can do with this. Number one, a, a good color profile should render a neutral black and white. And the color profile also uh, has the data of where the black point is in the paper and what the shadow detail is and that sort of thing. Obviously, if you've toned your black and white, if you have a warm tone or a cool tone to the computer, it's effectively a color image. It's just a very light brown or a very light blue. So then you would you definitely want to use a color profile. If you have an Epson printer, you can use Epson's advanced black and white mode, which allows you to do that color toning in the print driver. So if you start with a with a neutral black and white, you can warm tone it, cool tone it, that sort of thing. And and Epson has a lot of documentation on their advanced black and white. Canon has a black and white mode in their driver. However, that just uses the 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 blacks and the grays in the printhead, so it does it prints it much more slowly. Um, it also doesn't allow you to tone it. But again, if you if you're making a lot of black and white prints, if you're a black and white photographer, work with the color profile, work with the Epson Advanced Black and White, or maybe you can try if you have an Epson printer, you can try or you can try the Quad Tone Rick we talked about a while back and see what your best results are.